<laughs> so now we can wake you up again and start with some very awesome talk at the very beginning by Joran Beel. Uh, so it's my pleasure to introduce to you. And I have to look at my smartphone, unfortunately, because he has a much more impressive CV than I have. So I can't learn it, actually. So he started already his master's at Lancaster University School in the uh, in UK. Then he was coming back to Germany and was doing his diploma in Magdeburg. Then he was a visiting researcher actually in Berkeley. Um, then was PhD student actually in Magdeburg again. Then he was a postdoc actually in Tokyo at the National Institute of Informatics. Then became an assistant professor at the Trinity College in Dublin. And now he's back in Germany and is a professor in Siegen actually. He's working for many years already on recommender systems and related fields. Um, since the last years, also looking more and more into automated machine learning and meta learning. So it's my pleasure to introduce you and be to you, and it's all yours. Okay, thank you very much. <clears throat> why should you, I mean, you are here to learn about AutoML. Why should you care about recommender systems? That's one question I'm hopefully going to answer in the next 90 minutes. What I mean by recommender systems is, you all know this, you are all familiar with recommender systems. If you go shopping on Amazon, if you use YouTube, TikTok, I don't know, who uses TikTok here? Can you raise your hand? Very few people, okay, that's good. <laughs> um, whatever online service you use, um, you are getting into contact with personalization and with recommender systems. Even when you don't think about recommender systems, very often there's recommendation technology used. For instance, on Google Maps, I don't know if anyone of you have ever realized that, but if you use different devices, maybe in different locations in, at different times or with different IPs, you will get different results um, even for the same. So actually, this is not really a recommendation, it's search. Yeah? If you search for best nightclub in Freiburg and you use your mobile phone, like here, you will get slightly different results than using a desktop version. So if you use your desktop, in, I use it in incognito mode in my hotel room, I think, um, and you see the order here is slightly different. The first search result is actually the same. This result, you don't see it here, it's, I scroll down. But then you have here Ruffetto and Drifters Club, and here Ruffetto and Cute Cactus. So you have a different um, ranking of results kind of personalized to you. Google is doing this maybe because you're do, using a different device. Um, and Google has learned that people using a mobile phone are interested in different um, nightclubs, something like this. So that's personalized search or recommendation. Both is very, very similar. And I use that interchangeably here today. Let me briefly introduce myself. I mean, Marius has done a great job um, showing that I like traveling. That is true. Um, I like traveling a lot. I've been living in different places right now. I'm a professor in Siegen. Um, I have three PhD students in my group. Two are over there, Lennart and Lukas. They are here. So also, if you are, if you like what I'm talking about today, um, and you want to do a joint project, feel free to talk with me or to talk with them. Just seeing, I don't see any time here, so I need to let's see if that works. Oh, no. um, right. Or if you want to have more information, just visit the website here, um, isc.bill.org. Marius already mentioned that my primary focus is on recommender systems. AutoML is more like a secondary research field for me, at least so far. Um, I've been coming from the field of digital libraries, actually, and recommender systems because digital libraries, I will talk about that maybe later, but is not a very promising research field anymore. I mean, who's going to libraries here or um, using like really consciously digital libraries? So a few of the old people here still do that. <laughs> um, yeah, so I move more towards AutoML, which is a very good um, addition to recommender systems and vice versa, in my opinion. I have well, obviously, done research in the field of recommender system. I have developed real world recommender systems. I worked on um, Ryanair rooms. So the like most of you know Ryanair from booking flights, but some of you might have used the hotel 
booking room system from Ryanair. I did a project on that. Um, I did a business startup, Darwin and Goliath, in the field of recommendations. So it's recommendations as a service. Members of my group have developed um, automated recommender systems. So similar to AutoML, it's software libraries that automate the development of recommender systems and hyperparameter tuning. And I created the website or the, uh, the, the news website recommendersystems.com. So if any one of you is interested on the latest news of recommender systems or just to learn more about recommender systems, I can strongly advise you to, to visit recommendersystems.com. My goal today is to help you or to make you understand the importance in general to have a secondary research field, the benefits of having that, the benefits of not just looking into one very niche field but being a bit broad and have like a secondary field and that recommender systems would be a very good secondary research field um that it's worth spending some time thinking about in which area you want to apply auto ml so not just using some data sets because everyone is using them but consciously think about because auto ML you can apply in any field. Yeah? You can use medicine, you can use recommender systems. Um, and you should spend some time thinking about which field is the right for you. And then eventually to look out of the box, explore other research fields like recommender systems, because many of these other research fields can help you um, to improve AutoML. So I'm assuming that all of you, your primary focus probably is AutoML, which is a very good choice. Um, it's a really, really interesting research field, I believe. Um, but I've also spoken with a few people here, like I think over there, those guys, their primary research focus is compilers. And they have similar problems like people have in AutoML, like optimization, going through large search spaces. So maybe you guys can also learn from compiler building or recommender systems to improve AutoML. The agenda is correspondingly, so I will talk a little bit about AutoML for recommender systems. Actually, I think I changed the order, but anyway, those are the three topics I'm going to talk about. AutoML for recommender systems, recommender systems to improve AutoML, and then the importance of having a secondary research field. And in the very beginning, I just talk very briefly about recommender systems so that you know um, what makes recommender systems special. And for now, when I say AutoML, I consider it in a very, under a very broad umbrella like algorithm selection, um, not necessarily for machine learning, but in general algorithm selection because recommender systems has machine learning algorithms and non-machine learning algorithms. And of course, not just algorithm selection, but also the configuration. Who of you is familiar with recommender systems already? Like who has a 10? My PhD students, of course. Um, so who of you has maybe attended a lecture, read a book? OK, just, just a few, but OK, very good, very interesting to know. There's two main types or two main tasks in recommender systems. The first one is rating prediction. Rating prediction is a bit outdated today, but this is how recommender systems evolved about 20 years ago. Rating prediction at that time was popular for, especially for movies, where the goal was to predict how much a user would like a movie. And at that time, users were commonly rating movies, giving stars from one to five, sometimes one to 10, whatever. Um, and then those companies try to predict how much a user would like a movie. And if they predicted the user would like a movie a lot, they would recommend it. Or they would just display um, the predicted rating so users could make an informed decision. Have you have heard of the Netflix price? I think that must have been 15 years ago now. Netflix um, offered 1 million euro or dollars, 1 million dollars to those people who could improve the prediction rate measured by RMSE um, by 10%. So that was, a, at that time, the primary metric to focus on how precisely, it's, a, it's like it's a regression problem. How precisely can you predict a rating? You can also treat it as a classification problem, of course. You can 
just have this as classes, one star, two star, three, four, five stars. Um, so you can apply machine learning here, but you can also apply other algorithms. And then the other task of recommender systems is top N recommendations. And that is probably the much more common task, especially nowadays. So the task is here to have some input that could be an article someone is reading right now, that could be a product someone is looking at right now, it could be just a user. And then you want to recommend a list of items. You know, here a list of news items or a list of advertisement, whatever. Both is kind of similar because you could use rating prediction and have then a post processing step in which you just rank items based on the predicted rating. Um, or if you have a top N ranking, there's some underlying score behind that, of course, and you could just display the, the score as well. Um, but it is different as such that um, with top N ranking, you cannot just use all standard classification and regression algorithms. If you imagine uh, you have some item as input, and then you want to know which, and it's maybe based on text, and you want to have a list of ranked items, you normally cannot um, use a standard classification or regression algorithm because you would have to compare the input item with each item in your data set. And if you are Amazon, or even if you just have a small web shop with 100,000 items, that would not be computational feasible, typically, not if you have many visitors. Um, and I would like to learn a little bit more about you if you could get out your mobile phones um, or your computers and just visit um, menti.com and type in this code here and then just participate in the survey. So about what type of data you work with mostly. I think you can choose two options. Just questions, what are you on the internet? Oh, that is not what it should be. Let me, maybe I need to do this. Is it changing now? No. Now it's changed. No change? And one other, the next one, what tasks are you focusing on? Typically regression or classification? Can I ask what is other? Like who shows other and what is it? Forecasting. forecasting? Like, like weather forecasting or stock market prediction? Or... Okay. Something else? Who shows other? Only the people in Hanover? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, whatever. Um, I think it's interesting to see this. Also, the, the, the type of data you use, tabular data. In recommender systems, you can also use tabular data, but then also often it's textual. You can actually you can use any type of data depending on the field of application. Um, often it's textual data, often it's a mix. 
often it's rating data, which is kind of tabular data, but I will talk about that in a minute. Um, for rating prediction, for instance, you have, you have tabular data, but it's typically just three columns, just a user item and a rating. Um, and you can get surprisingly good results with this little amount of data to make predictions how users um, will do this. So let me see. Okay. So what's the difference between recommender systems and machine learning? Often there is no difference. You can apply standard machine learning algorithms to solve some recommendation tasks. Um, often you have tabular data, but also often this tabular data, just as mentioned, is very small. You only have these three columns, rating, user, and item. So compared to probably your standard daily machine learning task, that is very little information. Um, and then, as mentioned already, the top N ranking um, approach differs from normal machine learning. When I say normal machine learning, I mean the standard task like regression or classification on tabular data, where you want to have a prediction for each item in your data set. But for recommender systems, you are not so much interested of having some kind of prediction for each item or for each row in your data set. You have typically the scenario where you have one user and you just want the five or 10 best items and you don't care about the rest. Um, or you have one article and then, but if you have any question, yeah, feel free to ask anytime. And also the other difference is there is many non-machine learning algorithms starting with very simple, most popular recommendations, which can be very effective and which also have hyperparameters that need to be tuned. And I believe also one big difference between um, recommender systems and machine learning is the fact that online evaluations are much more important for recommender systems than for the typical machine learning task. Because let's say you use what's a standard machine learning task, image, image classification. So, um, you have your offline data set and you want to do that in your production system as well. You, know, you want to classify, I don't know, on Facebook, friends recognition, you want to classify which person is on the photo. If you do that on an off, if, if you do that on your offline data and you have an algorithm that works well, I would assume chances are quite high this works also then in the production system quite well because it's just exactly the same data. For recommender systems, this is more difficult. You don't have for top end ranking data like this. You have maybe from an online system, the data, which recommendations were clicked. So or which items were bought by a customer. Maybe you, you have a shopping cart for one customer, like for a large number of customers, you have their shopping carts, you know which products they bought together. Then you would maybe, re and, and you want to predict which items a user buys. So you have the information which item a user really bought, and you could argue, okay, if you can predict this item, then that's a good algorithm. That's a valid assumption. But the problem is you have 1 million items in your catalog that the user probably hasn't seen. So if you would recommend an item from that catalog only because the user didn't buy it doesn't necessarily mean that would be a bad recommendation. That's a big problem in recommender system that you have some positive signals, you know, maybe a user clicked this and this and this item. Maybe you also know um, you had th these 10 recommendations and the user didn't click eight of them. So, you know, those eight items are not good recommendations, but you cannot make any assumption about those millions of articles in your catalog that were not recommended in your data set. That makes it also difficult to create a data set. Um, you can't go through a million items and say, okay, this would be a good recommendation for this user. This is not, this is not, this is not. Um, yeah, and then recommendations are very subjective depending on the user, even depending on the time or the purpose. So that makes it more difficult to have good data, but also makes it more interesting from a research perspective and for tuning um, algorithms, very challenging. I talk about that later. I first want to give you an overview briefly um, about a few algorithms. The most simple algorithm that works very well is popularity based in one way or another. If you use Netflix, for instance, 
you will see you have these um, rows and many of them will be based on a simple heuristic like new releases, most popular in Germany, um, most popular on Netflix, new, um, worth the weight here. So I'm not sure how that's calculated, but those three are definitely based on some simple heuristic and in many domains, it works very well. But you also have still many hyperparameters here. Popularity, there's not just one popularity. You can measure popularity based on view time, based on how often it was maybe shared. Um, then even if you use view time, the hyperparameters are, does a user need to watch the movie till the very end? I think Netflix only, cons Netflix considers a movie to be watched if it's just watched for a few minutes. Um, then what's like if you look for news articles, for instance, you can have sequence sequences to measure popularity. Um, or yeah, you see it here, it's, it's German, like most shared, most read, most commented. And you can have, of course, all three of these categories, or you could just choose one. So that is something to the best of my knowledge. It would be worth exploring an AutoML or an automated recommender system, but it hasn't been explored. Simple algorithms with hyperparameters um, to look through. The probably most common algorithm is, or the most popular algorithm in recommender systems, because it was one of the first ones, is collaborative filtering. You have a matrix with users and items and how the users rated those items it can be binary just liked or disliked or it can be like said before a five star rating so you have this spa and typically this matrix is very very sparse uh, much more sparse than here in the example um, and then your goal is to predict this one rating for a certain user and you can use very simple algorithms that the, the, the first one that was used here 20 years ago was just correlation. Then um, you can, depending on what data you use, you can use KNN, distance in the vector space between those users, especially if you have a few more features. Or you can also use machine learning for this. Um, and this works surprisingly well for rating prediction. I'll show you later, we did some experiments where we compared these simple algorithms with machine learning um and the simple algorithms perform quite well one more question for you i hope oh wait probably i need to use the browser if you imagine you want to predict a movie rating it ranges from one to five the scale you measure your precision with mean absolute error what do you think would be a good mean absolute error on average Keep in mind, this is something the community has been working on since the beginning, since 20 years. So this could be me in what a state of the art right now? Yeah. Okay. You, know, you want to pre predict a rating? You have a data set in which you have, you know how a user rated a movie and you want to predict this with your machine learning algorithm or whatsoever. Scale is one to five. So the correct answer would be here. Um, it's still around, depending on the data set, of course, but it's around 0 0.7, 0 0.8, 0 0.9. Um, I mean, it's up to you if you believe that's good or bad. I personally find it a bit disappointing, but it's not too bad. I mean, if you imagine maybe the true rating is four and you predict a 3.2, well, it's not really good if you consider that, <laughs> if you consider that the community is working on this a long time but that's the state of the art and it hasn't improved a lot it i think in the beginning it was maybe around one and now it's like 0 0.8 um very roughly yeah do you know what the noise is e what would the user say three four e yes exactly that's the point um wait no there's a lot of noise or 
second. This is a very nice paper, and like, I like the heading. I think it's very important you have a good title for your paper. It's called The Magic Barrier of Recommender Systems, and it's analyzing this effect that you cannot, you can never predict a rating perfectly because there is a lot of noise. Um, first, general noise, like you always have if users provide data, you know, they maybe click on the wrong star, they confuse maybe the scale, things like this, but even despite of those things, um, users don't rate consistently movies. If you watch a movie now and think, oh, amazing movie, and you would, and someone would ask you in one month, how was the movie? Chances are you would differ by May. I mean, you wouldn't say, oh, that was a horrible movie, but you would say maybe one star less just because you're in a bad mood or something like this. Um, so there's a lot of noise here that is difficult to predict and that makes it much more challenging than a standard classification task like where you predict cats and dogs because a dog is a dog and a cat is a cat and um, that's 100 percent sure there's no discussion about that so you could expect an accuracy of 100 percent roughly um, you will never achieve 100 percent although you would come probably very close to that optimum you can't do that you can't expect that in recommender systems and the same is probably true for AutoML. Um, you can't expect AutoML to be perfect. I think there will be always some noise in it. You, I mean, as long as you don't try out all the billions of hyperparameters, you cannot be 100% sure. So I'm still waiting for a paper called The Magic Barrier of AutoML um, to see how, or especially if you go into something like per instance algorithm selection, when you try to have for each instance the best algorithm and you, or you have the oracle that would be perfect, but you will never achieve the oracle. Another, I need to hurry up a little bit. Um, another approach is content-based filtering, where you just look at the content of items. So you have, you look at one news article, for instance, and look for other articles that contain the same words. So the user is reading an article, you look for similar articles and you recommend those articles to the user. It's different from just compare from collaborative filtering where you try, yeah, I didn't, I, I didn't explain this really in detail. Just so the way that this works is you look which users have a similar taste, which users have rated the same movies similarly. So if Frank and I rated the same movies similarly, this would be identified. And then those movies that I haven't watched, but Frank has watched and that he has rated positively would be recommended to me. These are not algorithms. These are rather concepts. And for each of these concepts, there's hundreds or thousands of specific algorithms and implementations. Yeah, so content-based filtering, the most sim simple approach is in the vector space. You're just plotting your documents or users to the vector space, um, similar to KNN, and then you identify neighbors there. You all know this, items that have been bought frequently together. Um, so this is like in the same shopping cart. This is very similar, but I'm not 100% sure what the difference is. Customers who bought this item also bought or frequently bought together. Maybe this is across different sessions from one user. I don't. Does anyone know? I mean, you are from, we have one person here from Amazon, so do you know? <laughs> I don't actually know because I'm not part of the Amazon. Okay. Website. Yeah. And and you see already, this is really different approaches like content based filtering, collaborative filtering, most popular, you can use graphs with machine learning or without machine learning. So if you have some items that are linked with each other, be it persons on Facebook, um, be it patterns that cite each other or research articles that cite each other, you can just use some graph metrics like hits or page rank to rank items or just to explore the area around. Um, some paper. So if you want 
if this is your input paper, this paper is citing C, D, and E, you could recommend paper B because it's citing the same. And you know, this is a very simple graph. Um, so you would also have, and I mean, this is a very large network. And then finally, the holy grail personalized recommendations, not just based on one input item, but some typically machine learning based nowadays, that's using all the information that you have looked at in the past and try to give you personalized recommendations. There's big differences between these algorithms um, because the major difference maybe is when you can apply it. Some algorithms you only can apply if you know already a lot about the user. If a user has rated many items, you can use collaborative filtering. Most popular, you can use always but it has a disadvantage that it's favoring popular items. So it's the German Matthäus effect, basically. Content-based filtering works for every item, but it recommends typically very similar items. And if you read Harry Potter 1, what's the most similar item? Harry Potter 2. But that's an obvious recommendation. It's not really good. I mean, if you read the book, I don't need to recommend Harry Potter 2 to you. You would buy it by your, I mean, you would be smart enough to know that there is a second part anyway of this. Okay, so which algorithm is best and which hyperparameters here? And this brings us now to AutoML. What do you think? Um, which of the algorithms is best? Hmm? Depends. <laughs> yes, it depends. <laughs> That's the right answer always. If someone asks you which out of a large number of choices is best the right answer is almost always it depends we will talk about what it depends on um, so let's talk first about the algorithm selection problem in recommender system and this is an experiment i did a couple of years ago we used five recommendation algorithms on six different um, german news websites here these are the algorithms there's two different variations of collaborative filtering here this one and this one, there's two different um, variations of most popular here, uh, most popular sequence, and just standard most popular. And then we have content-based filtering. It was an offline experiment, I think based on precision. So um, like how many of the actual click recommendations did we predict correctly? I think something like this. And this here's the different websites. So if you think about a news website, German news website, what do you think, which of the algorithms will be best? Have a guess. If, if, if you are implementing a news website and you are the CTO and you must have, you must make a decision. And of course you could just say we implement them all. Um, but I mean, also those five algorithms are just five out of thousand. So And I assume most of you say most popular because you know that many news websites use most popular. Um, so it must be the best, right? But there's also another reason why many news websites use most popular, and that is simply because it's very easy to calculate. If you use content based filtering, for instance, um, you need a gigantic database, um, and it's, it uses much more storage and computational power than most popular recommendations. Now I show you the result for the first one. The standard most popular algorithm performed very poorly. The most popular sequence performed second best. So you see that small variations in an algorithm can already have a major impact. And in this case, what's this? User-based collaborative filtering was best. Now let's look at the second one. You see a small difference here. This time, the standard most popular algorithm by far was the best. And let's look at the other ones. This doesn't look really good, I would say, in terms of you want to know which algorithm is best for, new, for your news website. 
So you see that algorithms perform really vastly different on different websites. And I would assume, I had the expectation that if you have a movie recommender system and you have a news recommender system, yeah, algorithms, probably you need completely different algorithms for this. But my expectations would be that across different German news websites, there should be like a trend at least, that maybe two algorithms are best on those websites, but that's not the case. Um, and this was an offline evaluation, but we did similar experiments in online evaluation. So with real users, we used click-through rate, and it was the same, um, similar results. And it's even worse, if you look at the data, in this case, based on the hour of the day, so yeah, here, this is the, the hour of the day, you see that starting from four o'clock in the afternoon, this blue algorithm, this most popular sequence, is best, notably better here, and it continues here. And then from around four o'clock in the morning, the standard most popular algorithm is best. And it doesn't, and you can look at almost every aspect. You could, could look at gender, you could look at device being used, you will always find that different algorithms are better. And this is not arbitrary. It's not random. Yeah? You see, it's clearly like from four o'clock on in the afternoon, it's always better, the blue algorithm, until four o'clock. So for 12 hours, for, or for until yeah, between two and four o'clock in the morning. Um, there's many variations that can cause this. It can be age, gender, language it can be the length of a title and if you th in the first moment you might think okay that's crazy but if you think about it it's not so surprising if you have a title that is very short content-based filtering maybe doesn't work very well if you use the words of a title and you just have two words maybe not very good to find related articles um, or i would assume that a person who visited the news website at three o'clock in the morning is a very different type of human than a person who looks at the news website at seven o'clock in the morning. So someone at three o'clock in the night is probably not so interested in popular news or I don't know. So it's, um, it, it could make sense, but the problem is how do you choose an algorithm then? Um, that's why I stroke through here the AutoML for Rexis and wrote Auto Rexis because I believe there's some reasons why automated machine learning for recommender systems will be a little bit different, not, not vastly different, but a little bit different from at least what we know nowadays as AutoML. Um, as mentioned, often recommender systems are equal to machine learning. So then autorexes would also be the same for AutoML. And you can apply AutoML libraries to many recommendation tasks nowadays. We, we did that. Um, but then again, these libraries don't include algorithms like most popular content-based filtering and so on and so forth. Um, also, I think AutoML focuses so far a lot of, on classification, maybe a little bit on regression, and at least out of the box, you cannot do top N ranking for recommendations, not in a computationally reasonable time, at least. You can do it with some post-processing steps maybe, but not out of the box. So I would love to see one day AutoML libraries that can do top N ranking out of the box, ideally with text or with different types of data. Um, not so much related here to, to AutoML, but would also be maybe an interesting field to explore. It's, I mean, multi-objectives is very common in machine learning and in AutoML as well. Marius has explained that yesterday. Um, but to the best of my knowledge, and please correct me if I'm wrong, um, in AutoML and in machine learning, multi-objectives refers to just different metrics like accuracy and maybe energy consumption um, or runtime, things that can very easily be measured in recommender systems, you have other multi, you also have those multi objectives, but you have other multi objectives as well. You have different stakeholders, like on Spotify, you must, with your recommendations, you must satisfy the subscribers, like normal users, 
and you must satisfy the artists and those interests don't align. An artist wants his songs recommended to every user, ideally. The users maybe want a large variety of different songs. Um, but then again, artists maybe, I don't know how the business model is on Spotify, but maybe artists receive different amounts of compensation. So there's many, many different aspects for that. Or group recommendations is a very interesting topic. Imagine you are traveling with a group and you want travel recommendations, then the object, then there's not just one simple metric that can satisfy or measure the quality. You have all those different persons in the group that needs to be satisfied. Or reciprocal, um, reciprocal recommendations like dating apps. Typically in recommendations and machine learning, you have like your input and you have your output. Like you have one user, you want to satisfy that users by recommending some items. But in dating apps, you have two users and you want to have for both persons good recommendations. It's more difficult to measure. There's a few automated recommender systems libraries. All of them are, I would say, very simple compared to standard AutoML libraries. Um, a few of them have been developed by some of my team members or students. Auto Surprise, Auto Case Rec, and then get Auto is just being developed right now by um, by Tobias, who is not here today. All of them are very basic. They do rating predictions, so the most simple task of recommender systems. So all libraries just try to predict and typically use RMSE then to predict a rating. So the first library, I think, was developed 2018, so a few years ago, um, and I would hope that more work is done in this field. So I'm not sure if you can, no, you can't see this. Let me see if I can enlarge this somehow. You know how I can zoom in and, ah, like this, touch. Um, okay, let me show you first the overview. So we, we did, how can I get back? <laughs> um, we did some benchmarking with a number of machine learning tools, recommender system tools, AutoML tools, and um, automated recommender system tools. Although, so behind each of these categories is a number of libraries. Only AutoRexis was a single library, AutoSurprise. Um, we used I think 19 data sets or 13 data sets and looked which of the libraries was best. All of these data sets are rating predictions. You see also um, there's many similar data sets like here, Amazon, 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 Amazon. <laughs> um, and I think also different movie lens variations or yeah, here movie lens, movie lens. So it's maybe, I don't know, five, let's say, completely different data sources. But what you see is that even among like one data source like Amazon, there's not always the one library that performs best. What you also see is differences are not extremely huge. Also, the differences between, so what this shows here is the, Like this is the first rank. So which library and which category perform best? Just zoom in to sh oh. So this shows RMSE or MAE, I'm not sure, I think RMSE. Um, So the difference between like the, the first rank and the second rank, I think in almost no case it was statistically significant, but still you see the trend and like the, what was significant is the fact that you see very little machine learning libraries here. Um, they are like beyond that, like rank six and higher and that difference was statistically significant. We used that all out of the box. So we had the scenario of an inexperienced users who has no idea about hyperparameter tuning and just throw the libraries at the data set. Um, 
What we found surprising is that automated recommender system libraries, even though very simple, did perform, let's say, roughly similar with AutoML here on those libraries. Mm -hmm. And for the automated recommender system libraries, we, I think we just used those three features. Leonard, is that right? So just user rating and item. And for the AutoML libraries, we used all the features we had in the data set. So many of the data sets had more features. They had the gender of users, they had the zip code um, for the movies, they had the genre and things like this. So even those old algorithms for recommender systems performed roughly the same as scikit-learn, uh, auto sklearn or teapot H2O and other libraries, which had much more complex algorithms and used much more features, which makes me optimistic that this can be improved even further in the future. If you want to see this in more detail, yeah. But would the grant system benefit from more features or why have you used only three? Um, we have just used those three because the library auto surprise is using collaborative filtering and that by default is just it's the algorithm itself, it's based on matrix factorization, um, is just, so surprise is just using these three features. And auto surprise is based on surprise, so it's just using yeah. those okay. three features. So, um, yeah, but I'm sure that this would be possible. I will go through this very quickly. That's my personal belief. I haven't been able to provide a lot of evidence for this, but I think that recommender systems is really, really well suited for per instance algorithm selection. Is anyone doing here per instance algorithm selections? Like typically this is for SAT solvers. Um, so where you try for each problem, for each row in your data set, have a different algorithm or predict which algorithm will be best. Can you just raise your hands again if, if you have ever done that? So very few people. Um, then let me briefly explain this. I showed you before that by each hour of the day, the performance can differ. And the same is true for each instance because it's not just the hour of the day that makes this different. It's There will be different users, different items in the background. So you could try to have like a meta model trained on this and whenever you want to give recommendations to a user, you first predict which algorithm is best. In theory, like the Oracle, if you were able to always predict the best algorithm, in theory, you could improve performance by 50% and more. So like the error, you could reduce it by half or in terms of accuracy, depending on how you measure it, you could increase it by 50%. Unfortunately, in practice, um, this hasn't been working yet, but I am convinced it must be possible because there must be some reason why the algorithms perform so differently. And I'm still hoping for this aha effect that one day this will work. This was just one experiment we did where we achieved. Um, so we, we tried some novel algorithm, but we, we had a random forest here as a baseline as a meta learner. So we, we trained a random forest to predict which algorithm to use. And the mean absolute error was reduced by 16%. Um, but that's still not as good as I would hope. Any questions so far? OK, let me talk a little bit about recommender systems or in general, the importance of a secondary research field. And I think AutoML is a great first research field. I think most of you consider that, and that is a good choice. Um, but I would say always have a backup plan. Think of, um, for instance, machine translation. For decades, machine translation has been a very promising research field, actually with little progress. And then deep learning came around. And I would say machine translation is a solved problem. Not everyone will agree with this probably, certainly not researchers in the field of machine translation. Um, most of you are quite young, so I don't know if you have ever used Google Translate or similar programs 10 years ago, it was just horrible. Um, but if you use, at least for European languages, yeah, I mean, maybe not German Chinese, but German English works extremely well. I recently had um, 
I'm married, I have a wife, we have a like a prenup, you know, like a ear vertrag. My wife is, is not German. So we had this German prenup translated, it's a legal document. We had that translated just by Deep L. And then we went to a lawyer who actually was German, but who also studied in England, who did his master's in law in England. So he knew both languages very well. And he asked us, where did we do this translation? It's really, really good. He didn't realize it was a machine translation for a legal document. So um, if you're a PhD student in the field of machine, machine translation, you have a problem because you won't be able to improve the state of the art. Um, maybe you can focus on a different field like life translations or so. But if you want to translate, improve the state of the art from written German text to English, I guarantee you, you will not succeed. <laughs> So, and who knows, maybe the same will happen with AutoML. Maybe in five years, AutoML is a solved problem. Maybe it just works perfectly well. I would hope that this is the case because I'm not a PhD student anymore. Um, <laughs> so, but you would have a problem. Um, and also just, it increases your chances to, like if you have a secondary field, it increases your chances to apply for open position. As I mentioned before, my primary focus is recommender systems. My secondary field was digital libraries. And when I applied for the position in Trinity College for a professorship in intelligent systems, honestly, in the beginning, I thought, oh, should I really apply? I'm not sure if I have a chance because Trinity College is one of the top universities in the world. Um, but I did apply. And when I was there for the interview, I, I learned, so the, the job description didn't mention anything about digital libraries. So I also wrote very little about, little about it in my application. But when I was there, I learned that this professorship position was sponsored by the computer science department and the library of Trinity College. And I got the job. Um, so, and I, I, I mean, there have been other applicants who probably have a better, stronger, reputation in machine learning and intelligent systems, but because I had the secondary knowledge in digital libraries, I got the job. Um, so it's a good thing to have a little bit of knowledge in other fields. Uh, spend 10% of your time would be my advice on the secondary research field. And maybe most importantly, I probably wouldn't be here if my secondary research field wouldn't be AutoML today. So if I would only be looking to recommend systems, I would be traveling less, I would be giving less guest lectures. Um, that's a nice thing. So why recommender systems? So how satisfied are you with recommender systems? Let's do a quick survey again. I think it's the last one. If you think of recommendations on Spotify, Amazon, YouTube, uh, I need to probably use Yeah, that's exactly what I was hoping for. Um, it's okay, right? Some of you think it's, it's quite good. Very few think it's very dissatisfying, but think about it. Like you don't, like in the field of machine translation, now all the people would probably say something here, which is not good because you can't improve it anymore. It's also not good if all people would say like this because recommender systems is 20 years old so if the state of the art would be still very dissatisfying, um, something would be very awkward. So it's like in the middle. So you can still improve it, but there have been some advances, probably. That's why I think it's a good secondary research field. Oh, no, no, it's not the end of my PowerPoint presentation. Yeah. So recommend assistance is still an unsolved problem with a large. Ah, uh, uh, yeah, this is all good. <laughs> so. Um, which shows that recommend assistance is really an unsolved problem. So Amazon is a multi-billion dollar um, company. They have pioneered recommend systems. I'm not sure if you have ever seen this, but if you go to like my account, they have a separate entry in the menu, your recommendations. 
think for a second, what do you think, which algorithm do they use to generate recommendations? I showed you what they recommend to me. They recommend to me, buy it again, buy it again, yeah. buy it again. Okay, Kindle eBooks. Um, so they have three times here, buy it again. That's the best that Amazon can do. Even though I'm using Amazon since 20 years, I'm buying quite a lot on Amazon, but that's the best they can do. So um, apparently, and I mean, for some things like a toothbrush, that makes sense, buy it again. But I don't need a new drilling machine um, that lasts for 20 years. So there's still lots of room for improvement on recommendations, I would say. Another nice thing about recommendations is it has a high impact. Marius, Marius mentioned that yesterday, recommender systems probably are one of the first applications for machine learning. And probably also one of the type of applications you get into contact every day if you use YouTube. Um, Netflix, Google Maps whatsoever. So if you can improve the state of the art, it really matters. It really has an impact. And it doesn't, I mean, you could argue, okay, does it really matter if I improve e-commerce? Maybe not, but you can also look into recommender systems in the field of medicine, for instance, where you have um, assisted um, diagnosis, for instance. That would really matter if you support doctors in improving diagnosing cancer or whatsoever. Um, yeah, and I think especially because you're interested in AutoML and recommender systems, really interesting field for the application of AutoML um, work could make an impact. Finally, not necessarily relevant to AutoML, but recommender systems is just very diverse. You can focus on the algorithms, algorithm selection, but you could also use on uh, focus on user interfaces, which has a strong impact on the satisfaction with recommender systems and which is an underexplored area. You could look into how to automatically create user interfaces and position user interfaces because it matters where recommendations are shown. It matters if they are displayed under some articles or on top or beside, how many recommendations to show. All these are hyperparameters that could and should be tuned, like how many recommendations to show, where to show them, what information to show about recommendations and so on. Um, yeah, and finally, it's a very good conference, the ACM Recommender System Conference. Every year when the conference takes place, we have a karaoke evening. That's a very, very nice tradition at the conference. Um, it's an A-ranked conference, so that's good. Um, especially, maybe not, so, I'm not sure how important it is in Germany, but especially if you would be applying for positions in England, Ireland, um, universities really look at the ranking of your conferences and journals where you have published. Also good for dinner party discussions. Everyone knows recommender systems. Everyone has an opinion on recommender systems. Not always positive, that's true. Like there's things like bias, filter bubbles, which is other good problems to be solved. Um, so from a research perspective, that's very interesting. Okay, that's the last slides. How can you use recommender systems for AutoML? And I want you to think a little bit about this. Um, yeah, right. So in general, why to look out of the box, like at compilers or recommender systems? Because chances are there's something that helps you solving your main problem in AutoML already. Yeah? Like if you have a you want to have a bathroom and a sink that is not getting dirty. Nature helps you already with a solution like the lotus flower effect that helps you to like wash away all the dirt very easily. So I want you now for five minutes, maybe talk with your neighbors to think about how can you use collaborative filtering for AutoML? Think about it alone or with your neighbor, two or three minutes. You remember collaborative filtering? You have here the users, the items, and a rating. It's very simple. Just the three um, user rating item data. What's the equivalent? 
for algorithms, data sets. Okay, any ideas? Any solution? Does anyone want to come here and present his idea? <laughs> Okay, I show you the solution or one of the solutions. I understand it's a very exciting topic, but you need to listen to me now again. <laughs> so this is just one of the possible solutions. Yeah, user are equivalent to data sets, items to algorithms, and the rating obviously is the performance um, of an algorithm on a data set. But there's a problem with this. What is that? Well, it's similar, yeah. So, but one problem is, at least in collaborative filtering, typically you have a sparse matrix um, with algorithm selection or meta learning. Typically, you wouldn't have a sparse matrix. You would run all your algorithms on all your data sets. Um, so you would need a solution to that, maybe some land, land markers. I'm not the first one who is doing this. So there has been a paper on this, CF for CF using collaborative filtering for recommending collaborative filtering. Um, based on the paper, obviously, of course, based on the paper that performs very well, I haven't really looked into detail into this, but it's just one example that you can use recommendation algorithms to recommend algorithms. And there's another example, which I like a lot. Um, think about, again, for a minute, how could you use content-based filtering for AutoML? And not for hyperparameter optimization, but rather for algorithm selection. So for predicting if an algorithm will perform well on a given data set or how well it will predict. Oh, what happened now? My... Share again. How can you apply the idea of so content based filtering again you look at the inside at the content of an item. Like the terms in the title or the abstract of a document. And then you look for related items, how can you apply that to machine learning I think that's much more. Yeah. You raised the hand. And uh, 
and then algorithms and works based on similar data sets and the measure here is arsenal or But you talk about meta features now from the data set, right? Yeah. In the scenario of content based filtering, what would be the user and what would be the item to recommend? The data set is actually the user. So, what you want to recommend, the item, is the algorithm. You need the content of an algorithm and of the users, of course. Yeah, so you would need some meta features um, of the input, let's say the data set, yes, but then you need the content of an algorithm. And use algorithm as a point in a parameterized space. Algorithm. Post, I mean, first of all, there's no right or wrong answer here. I mean, that's um, yes, you possibly could do that. Yeah, maybe, but I, I think that's an interesting point. That uh, yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure if I've understood everything correctly, but I believe it's interesting to see that, and that's something I, and I'm not the first one actually who saw that because a good colleague of yours um, did that um, first, Lars Kotthoff and his group. Typically in AutoML, you consider an algorithm as an entity without any specific features. It's just an algorithm with certain hyperparameters and certain performance values. But I really like this paper from Lars Kotov. Um, it was published at the AutoML conference this year and the abstract, I think, two years ago at CoSeal workshop. They use software engineering techniques to look at the source code of algorithms. So that's really the content of an algorithm. If you maybe look at the source code or find some inherent characteristics of an algorithm and use that in addition to all the things you use anyway in AutoML. Of course, I mean, meta features of data sets, there's probably hundreds of papers about that or more, um, but there's very little work on the content of algorithms. How can you use the characteristics of an algorithm um, really to match that to a data set? So, to the best of my knowledge, this has been the first paper in this field um, that looked at that, and it's very related. I mean, Lars Kotthoff has nothing to do with recommender systems as far as I know, so he got this idea more from the field of software engineering. Um, but someone from the field of recommender systems kind of equally well could have had this idea because it's very similar to content based filtering. So that I think concludes. Uh, and there have been other papers already that looked into the field of recommender systems, also at the AutoML conference this year. Um, so these people used recommendation techniques um, to recommend algorithms. So that concludes my presentation. Yeah, and if, if you like this, and if you have maybe some other idea how to improve AutoML based on recommendation techniques, there's Leonard and Lucas, and I'm here, <laughs> but I'm leaving today but they will stay here longer, talk with them, um, and I would be happy to work together on this. Any questions? Yes. Thank you. Oh. For questions, ah. please make sure that Tidian can reach you first so that our participants and Hanofa can also hear the question. Um, you said that deep learning really revolutionized uh, machine translation. How did it impact recommender systems? <laughs> yeah, that's a very good question. I had a slide about that, but we moved it. Um, two years ago, they have, uh, obviously, there have been many research papers that use deep learning to improve recommenders, to, and they claim they have improved recommender systems. But two years ago or three years ago, um, was a paper that tried to reproduce all the results. They looked at about 16 research papers, I think. And um, I think none of those papers, when re being reproduced and re-implemented, could beat very simple baselines. So 
those 16 papers, they didn't tune hyperparameters of the baselines or they didn't use any, let's say, reasonable baselines. Um, so at least I don't, I'm very sure that deep learning is used successfully in large companies for recommender systems, but at least the research papers being published in that field haven't really advanced the state of the art, I would say. So the current, current state, state of the art, art are older, older models, models right now? Right now? It, it depends, or it's like, it's very difficult to say what is the state of the art. That's, that relates back to the problem that on every website, a different algorithm performs best. It's, you, you know, for image classification, you could say the state of the art, at least for a baseline, is a CNN. If you want to do image classification, you start with a CNN, and then you, you look how to go on from that, maybe. I, really, if you tell me you want to have a recommender system for scenario X, I cannot really tell you what, even what concept to use. I mean, unless you tell me you have a very new system, users haven't rated anything, obviously you can't use collaborative filtering. But despite that, I couldn't tell you this is the state of the art start with this. Actually, what I could tell you is try out as many algorithms as you can and then look which one is best and from there on maybe improve up on that. And that's why I believe that AutoML could be so important for recommender systems if it somehow is done right. Okay. That, that, also, that makes also makes sense, sense because to me it felt like, like the different, different approaches you considered in your automatic recommender, recommender systems, systems were more, more simple, simple approaches. So, so, you, so don't you don't think your automatic, automatic recommender systems, systems would improve, would improve much if you implement more, more complex Approaches. No, I think they would. Um, okay. Not not on the sim. We also use simple data sets mostly. This was really just a first benchmark to see in general how it goes. In recent years, there have been competitions in recommender systems with very large, very complex data sets. On those data sets, you couldn't use those just three features. You would need some more advanced algorithms. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> On many of the competitions, XG Boost is just performing best. So, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you for the great talk. But, uh, but uh, I, I have a follow-up follow question, 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 and and, and, and that, that is. That is the, the, the simple, simple methods, methods you showed used only, only these three features, features but, but then, then for the machine learning algorithms, algorithms you actually yeah, use um, um, yeah, user yeah, attributes, attributes and item attributes, attributes and so on. And, so on. and, and, and it just can't, can't possibly possible. believe that you can't, can't make, make uh, recommender systems better, better with that. that. So I guess so that, I guess that's, that's, that's what, what these uh, deep learning papers, papers did, and then those are the not reducible ones. You have better yeah, features, features, you should get better, better performance. performance. So, so I, I, it's somewhat doesn't compute. compute. Yeah, I understand that this is the first impression you may get. But you, if you think about it, so it's rating prediction. You want to predict ratings for movies or products on Amazon. And most of these data sets are pruned. So they only have users with at least 5, 10, 20 ratings. Imagine we have watched the same 20 movies and rated them almost identically. I think it's not a surprise that then this one movie that you have watched and liked that I also will like this a lot. And this is a very good prediction. So that's a typical recommendation approach. The machine learning approach would be to look at the look at one row where you have the users, age, gender, zip code, maybe the average rating, some meta features and predict the rating based on that. It's a very different approach and I'm not surprised that but, but, but you could also you have, have a KNN or, or something that, that actually does this, and you can have a transformer that actually looks at similarity of users. And yeah, so many of the libraries do use KNN as well to, to identify similar users and then um, recommend the items. I believe possibly KNN was even best sometimes. Um, give me a quick look. Nothing SVD is most of the time, uh, but just as an example, here KNN was best. So um, right, so you can use that, but 
more features don't so and this was just knn based on the three features actually it's just two features yeah? and the rating is um is the thing you want to predict so it's basically just two features um and more features don't necessarily help it's introducing noise it's the best thing we can do is if we have 20 movies in common and same rating seems to be enough and is it just is it small just data small sets and that's why, that's why no on no so like this one has 1 million ratings 1 million user movie ratings so i think that's a quite reasonably large there's also a 20 million version of this and results are similar so that's i would say 20 million is quite a large data set <laughs> It, it, it just, just looked like, like something, something, something that should that be should impossible, be impossible. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe uh, yeah, yeah that's yeah, just that's uh, fueling, fueling what you said, you said. yeah um, there's work to be done but then again this is rating prediction I, I would hope that the community in the future focuses more on top n recommendations ranking uh, i think do you want to just add to that lucas so my phd student has an addition Yeah, so, yeah, so maybe, maybe just a uh, follow-up follow on this. On this. Um, I have also worked a little bit with the traditional additional context as an assistant. And, and um, you can, can see, see that the um, field, uh, which, uh, which is from the context of an assistant, add additional content, whatever that may be, uh, is emerging now, now and they are uh, looking to uh, include uh, context in the assistant. assistant. Uh, with various, various success, success, success. Um, um, main, main reason why, why especially those uh, that say older, older arguments in the analysis don't use the uh, context, context was, was a case of basic account uh, uh, of the work. The work. So, so uh, uh, people, people are starting to find uh, uh, deep learning process resources that also includes context. But, but uh, we have yet to see how good it, it is. Um, uh, but we know, we know from the companies, uh, the ranks of companies, they, they use a lot, a lot of cost of just at this point. Uh, uh, just, not just not always clear how, how they incorporate it into their education. So it's not to so 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 engage the actual performance of what the context actually matters. How context matters. Scenario. Scenario. Over there. Thank you for the very nice presentation. Um, Checking your, your I, I have two questions, questions, but they are related to each other. So checking, checking your uh, results, results that you were showing between the different hours and different uh, news portals. Uh, I saw that this item based, I'm, I'm a bit familiar with that one technique a bit more. So I saw that in, in average it was performing OK. And I also saw that uh, when you show different uh, automated recommending system approaches, none of them are doing any pre-processing of the data. So do you think that if pre-processing would be automated, uh, despite every type of other uh, automated approaches, no matter if you are using that for auto ML or auto recommended systems or you know other things that can be used, do you think that in general then we will get the you know, free lunch theory over different approaches, so item based would uh, perform as good as every other thing? And this is this is very much motivated from representation learning methods. That's exactly what neural nets are doing. They are just learning more abstract uh, features of your problem, and then you have the same optimizer over different tasks. So if you have a good automated pre-processing, then all the other techniques for doing some prediction they would, in general, in average, uh, perform uh, the same. So I think my answer is I don't know. I would hope it does. But so far in recommender systems, very often things maybe don't work out as you would expect it to be. So probably, uh, hopefully, yes, that's the answer. Yeah, because, yeah, because in item set, set, in item mining set, sets, uh, the, problem the problem there is actually compressing the theories because they are very good at learning. So if you think about compressing some theories, then that's exactly like learning some very specific features, very high level features that can uh, 
exactly mimic your original theory and then it's a very easy learning task so i think all of us should focus more on the pre-processing of the data because everything else then will benefit of this okay yeah so yeah. <laughs> it's, something it's something that i'm looking on and it's actually really it makes a, a lot of difference okay because because you're using you are moving the optimizer from the learning algorithm outside mm -hmm. and then the learning process will become much easier okay maybe later we can talk in more detail how that sure. could be applied to recognize yeah <laughs> Uh, you, uh, you mentioned that, that uh, uh, it, it is difficult to use AutoML for the top end ranking uh, problem. Can you maybe explain a bit more the what the nature of this difficulty is? The difficulty is that with top, so um, at least with a standard algorithm, so top end recommendations mean this. The first approach to do top n recommendations is normally in the vector space. It's similar to KNN. So you can use KNN for this with some optimization techniques so that you don't have to compare the distance between your input item and all the other items. So that's the. <laughs> with top n recommendations, you have one input item the user or the article a user is currently looking at. And then you need to know which of the items in your database is most relevant. So what you could do is go through each item in your rows, each item in your catalog and compare the dis calculated distance or relevance metric. But um, you, you can't do that really if you have a very large catalog, especially not if you also have, like it's an exponential problem, you need for each article to go through all the other articles in the catalog and calculate the distance. Um, so you need at least some optimization to restrict the number of potential candidates. And of course you can do that, um, but that would be an additional well, pre-processing step then. Yeah. Not convinced? Thank you. Thank you. I'm, still I'm still not sure, sure. what the problem, problem is. <laughs> so, so um, I, think, I think the, the problem, problem is, is that the machine learning argument is very easy to go for the That's one of the issues here. So, this is the problem that we are going to get. We can apply it to this ranking. Because of how we should rank it. Right? You could do it and then you could always call for this the uh, uh, regression or justification results, but uh, it's not, not something that will work really well. Um, the only way it can work is if you also want to practice the algorithm to do it, but uh, uh, that's not accurate at all. So, so let me give you an example. Let's say you want to use a very simple neural network, a multi layer perception. Huh? Very simple for machine learning, very simple. And then you have your input article and you want to know which, like let's say a news article, and you want to know which of your 100,000 news article is most related. Then you would have to make a prediction with your multi-layer perceptron for each of the 100,000 articles and calculate a prediction. And that would take a lot of time. And the problem is you don't have to do that just one time for one input article. You have a thousand users within one minute on your website so you need to do that a thousand times within one minute for each of the thousand articles someone is visiting. You go through all your hundred thousand articles and predict the distance, or not the distance, you predict the relevance. And then you need to sort it and rank it. And that is not feasible. Um, and of course, you can use KNN and look at the surrounding neighbors. But if you have a million or like Amazon, a billion products in your catalog, you also run into problems if you want to just simply load your 1 billion products into memory and find the nearest neighbors. You can optimize that somehow, but not just like this. Basically, <laughs> yeah. 
because they focus on classification and regression in your life. How I understand what you said. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah, but I mean the top from us is like so you can also put this into these categories, but uh, it's a little more special. I have a very have different a very question. question. So, um, at one point, you mentioned that you have uh, for different user groups, you might have different algorithms. Mm -hmm. Are people actually looking at fairness and so on? Yeah. There, when, you, when you use different algorithms for different people, and, like, yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's an important topic since a few years in recommender systems, fairness, like, and everything that relates to it, like filter bubbles and bias, because machine learning is often used. So you have some bias if you're training for some recommendations. Um, yeah. Just a really quick follow-up. Uh, some of these algorithms of the existence actually are just built for fairness analysis. No, I, I, was, I was particularly wondering about, about you know, if you use different algorithms for different, different user, user groups, groups then that's 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 another level of tool to clear your fairness So there's like a lot of, you know, big body on the on fairness and right. Good. Good. Thank you. Last question, maybe, or? Just on this topic, the different algorithms. Is there any thought about letting people choose? What algorithm they want, or letting, or letting people choose, choose whether they're like three in the morning, seven in the morning, 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 yeah, it's more about feedback loops. Like maybe you have seen that on, on Twitter, you know, you get, I mean, Twitter basically is a recommender system, like because yeah. Twitter decides what news you see. You don't see all the news from all your followers or from all the people you follow. So you can say this is not relevant for me. And sometimes you even can say why it's not relevant. You know, it's like abusive or it's just not interesting to me. Um, so this then feeds back to the recommender system, but normally users don't choose, I want to see popular recommendations or, or this or that. And ideally, I mean, that's the idea of a recommender system that you don't need to do anything. You just get the items that are most relevant to you. That's at least the vision. Good, okay. I think time is up. Thank you very much for all the good questions.